Total Solar Eclipses, one of nature's most truly awe-inspiring events. It's incredible! The perfect alignment of the moon with our sun. But how do they happen? And more specifically, how do we know exactly when they will occur? In this video, we're going to go through some real lunar data and see how it can be used to predict the total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024. The orbital dance between our sun and moon is elaborate, and there's several conditions that must be met in order for these bodies to align. If I put this here and my phone here, I have a total eclipse of the phone. It's a bit more complicated than that. The interplay between the moon's distance from Earth, the phase of the moon, and the lunar orbit's nodal alignment with the sun each play pivotal roles in determining the type and time of the total solar eclipse. We'll be detailing each one of these conditions, and by the end of this video, you'll understand the key steps to this celestial dance. The only thing left you'll need to do is to go and see it for yourself. In its most basic sense, a solar eclipse occurs when the moon perfectly aligns between the sun and the earth. This casts a shadow on a particular region of earth for a brief period of time. But the exact geometry of this configuration ultimately determines the type of eclipse that will occur. There are four types of solar eclipses. The first being the total solar eclipse. This is the most exciting one. And this is what's occurring in the continental United States on April 8th, 2024. Also referred to as totality, a total solar eclipse usually sweeps over a 10,000 mile long path, but only 100 miles wide. Totality at a particular location occurs for only a few fleeting minutes, usually less than five. And the shadow travels in a west to east direction, following the moon's orbit around the Earth. More on the orbital specifics of the moon later. During totality, the moon completely blocks the sun's primary face, or photosphere. What's exposed around the moon is the sun's corona, a 1 million degree Celsius atmospheric layer of the sun, extending several solar radii past the sun's surface. The reason behind the corona's extreme heat is still an open scientific question, as the sun's surface hovers around 5600 degrees Celsius. Regardless, the light of the corona observed during the total solar eclipse isn't actually emitted from the corona at all. The source of the light is from the sun's photosphere, being scattered by the free electrons within the corona. Since the density of the corona is around 10 million times lower than the sun's surface, it's okay to observe a total solar eclipse with the naked eye, without protective glasses. But full disclaimer, this is the only time when it's safe to do so. Special UV blocking safety glasses must be worn during the moments leading up to and the moments preceding a total solar eclipse. For more information, refer to the American Astronomical Society's guidelines, linked in the description below. The second type is an annular solar eclipse. Not as exciting. This type of eclipse has all the familiar elements of a total solar eclipse with one key exception. The moon is at or near its farthest position from the Earth during its orbit. When the moon is at this position, it appears smaller in the Earth's sky and doesn't quite block the full photosphere of the sun from view. Hence, the annular solar eclipse looks like a bright ring or annulus which is where the name annular solar eclipse comes from. Because of the bright light from the sun's photosphere, these eclipses need to be viewed with the appropriate UV safety glasses. The third type is the partial solar eclipse. This type of eclipse occurs when the moon only partially covers the sun as viewed from Earth, hence the name partial. When the sun, moon, and Earth aren't perfectly aligned, a partial solar eclipse results. This is the type of eclipse viewers will also see during the moments leading up to and preceding a total or annular solar eclipse. The final type is the hybrid solar eclipse. This is the rarest type of eclipse, and as the name suggests, is a mix between an annular and total solar eclipse. When the moon is closer to the midpoint distance along its orbit around Earth, the Earth's curvature becomes significant. When the shadow of the moon initially lands on Earth, the shadow is farthest from the moon, and an annular eclipse occurs. As the shadow sweeps across its eclipse path, the distance between the Earth and the Moon decreases due to Earth's curvature. At some point, the eclipse can shift into a total eclipse. Although these events are less common, the total eclipses viewed during a hybrid solar eclipse 
are generally shorter in duration than those viewed during a normal total solar eclipse. So what are the exact conditions needed for a total solar eclipse to occur, and why are they so rare? There's a lot of subtleties here that we need to consider. We need to consider the orbit of the moon around the Earth, the lunar phase of the moon, and the orbit of the Earth around the sun. We'll cover each of these in detail, but before we get too far, make sure to subscribe to my channel, and then hit that like button. Okay, with that out of the way, let's begin with how all things begin. Darkness. It's easy to forget how light really behaves in the day-to-day -day here on Earth. But basically, when you have a source of light in space, the light waves travel outward from the source in a straight path. When an opaque object such as our moon intersects the beam, the light's path is obstructed. The side of the moon facing the light source reflects the obstructed light in a different direction and appears illuminated. The side of the moon facing away from the light source is dark since the light is unable to travel through the object. If you place a screen on the dark side of the moon, you'll see the moon cast a shadow on the screen. Notice, there's two parts to the shadow, the dark inner region and a less dark, fuzzier region. In astronomy, the dark inner region is referred to as the umbra of the shadow, and is the area where all light from the source is completely blocked by the moon. The less dark area is referred to as the penumbra, and is formed by light that's partially blocked by the moon. From a side view, notice how rays from the light source's bottom half are obscured by the top half of the moon, and hence form a shadow. But the light rays from the top half of the light source have a clear, unobstructed path to the same shadow region. This is why the shadow in the penumbra region is less dark than that of the umbra. Because the light source is symmetric around its central axis, these cross rays trace out the outline of the circular penumbra shadow. Now, if we replace the screen with our planet and scale things to size, you can see how this shadow would be cast on Earth. It is the umbra region of the shadow that will appear as a total solar eclipse. Viewers located in the penumbra region will only see a partial solar eclipse. This only explains half the battle. We need to figure out the exact conditions for when this can occur. The nifty flashlight is of course light from the sun, located 93 million miles away. And the Earth, sun, and moon are a very dynamical system. Let's first consider the Earth-Moon system. The Earth and Moon are both massive objects, and hence gravitationally attract each other. Fortunately, the Moon doesn't fall into the Earth due to its high orbital velocity, which averages a little over 1 km per second, or over 2200 miles per hour. But because the Moon's gravitational pull on Earth is fairly significant, the Earth and Moon actually orbit around their shared center of mass, or barycenter. For the Earth-Moon system, this falls a little over 2,900 miles from Earth's center, or within Earth itself, at around three-quarters of Earth's radius. So while most people realize the Moon orbits Earth, the Moon also causes Earth to orbit around the Earth-Moon's center of mass, which adds a wobble to Earth's rotation. This also means that the Moon's orbit around Earth is not circular, but slightly elliptical, having an eccentricity of just 0.0549. For reference, the eccentricity of a perfect circle is zero. The Moon's elliptical orbit implies its distance from Earth changes during its orbital cycle. Sometimes the Moon is farther from Earth, with the farthest distance being 253,000 miles, and referred to as the apogee, and sometimes the Moon is closer to Earth, with its closest distance being 226,000 miles away, and referred to as the perigee. The variance between its closest and farthest points to Earth is around 12%. From our view here on Earth, this 12% difference in distance translates to a 25% larger moon in our sky between its closest and farthest distances. Oftentimes in the media, you'll hear of supermoons, which occur when the full moon is closest to Earth, or at its perigee. And in regards to eclipses, this apparent area difference is exactly what determines whether the eclipse will be total versus annular. The moon must be at or near its closest distance to Earth in order for a total solar eclipse to occur. If the moon is too far away, or at its apogee, it's just shy of shielding us from the entire sun. So for this first piece of the puzzle, I wanted to plot the moon's daily location data, detailing its distance from Earth over the years 2023 to 2024 and see what this looks like. If you're interested in playing around with this lunar data yourself, 
You can find it freely on the US Navy's Astronomical Applications Department website, which I've linked in the description below. After obtaining the Moon's daily location data, we want to call attention to any time the Moon is closest to Earth, or at its perigee, since this is when total solar eclipses occur. So instead of plotting the Moon's raw distance numbers from Earth, let's normalize the Moon's distance so that 1 corresponds to perigee and 0 corresponds to apogee. This normalization will allow us to make a fair apples-to-apples -apples comparison between this data and the other data sets used in this video and in general is a very powerful data visualization technique employed across the board in everything from finance to artificial intelligence. So at the beginning of 2023, the moon was closer to apogee. It continues to travel away from Earth until reaching its farthest point on January 8th. After reaching this point, the moon starts its path back towards Earth and reaches its closest distance to Earth on January 21st. The moon then travels back to apogee and the cycle continues. We can determine the orbital period of the moon based simply on the time elapsed between perigee to perigee, which is 27 days. Now remember, total solar eclipses occur when the moon is at or near perigee. So possible total solar eclipse dates include any time when the moon is near a maximum on this plot. Notice that a maximum does indeed occur on April 8, 2024. But these maxima occur every 27 days, so while it meets this criterion, there's certainly more to it. So let's keep this chart in mind for now and continue digging. But one more side note before moving forward. You may notice something kind of odd with this plot. The peaks and valleys of the curve aren't exactly constant and have a periodic structure themselves, which shouldn't be the case for a perfectly elliptical orbit. I initially thought this might be an artifact in the data set, but it turns out this is a real effect. Because the Earth and Moon aren't the only objects in the universe, the elliptical axes of the Moon's orbit fluctuate due to other gravitational influences, such as the Sun or nearby planets, such as Venus and even Jupiter. This is why the Moon isn't reaching its absolute minimum and maximum distances upon each orbit. These kind of slight complications are what make using real data both interesting as well as challenging. Now that we know the Moon's distance requirements for a total solar eclipse, we can move on to the Moon's phase. Remember, the Moon's phases arise from the relative position of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. For instance, when the Moon is between the Sun and Earth, the side of the Moon facing Earth is completely dark. This is what we refer to as New Moon. As the Moon continues counterclockwise around its orbit, more light is reflected towards Earth until reaching Full Moon. After reaching full moon, the moon begins reflecting less and less light towards Earth along its orbital path. Once the moon comes back to new moon, the lunar cycle repeats. So the only time when the moon is between the sun and the Earth is during its new moon phase. Hence, the new moon is the only phase when it's possible to cast a shadow on Earth and result in a solar eclipse. One question you might ask is, do the moon's phases exactly align themselves with the moon's distance from Earth? For instance, if you remember from before, it takes the moon 27 days to complete one orbit around Earth. Can we determine the moon's distance from Earth based on its phase? Well, based on our knowledge of supermoons and the types of eclipses, it's safe to say no. But why exactly? If you take a snapshot of the Earth-Sun-Moon configuration during a new moon, and then fast forward in time, you'll notice when the moon completes its orbit around Earth, it's no longer aligned in another new moon phase. While the moon was completing its orbit around Earth, the Earth was also moving a little further along its orbit around the Sun. It takes the moon an additional two days to come back into alignment between the Sun and the Earth. So a lunar cycle takes 29 days to complete, while a complete lunar orbit takes 27 days. This asynchrony is what drives the different types of eclipses. We can see this played out in our lunar data. Let's take a look at the lunar phases during the years 2023 and 2024. The data from the US Navy Observatory has daily information on the Moon's percent of illumination as viewed from Earth. But for solar eclipses, we want to call attention to each time the Moon takes a new moon phase, or 0% illumination. So instead of plotting percent illumination, we can invert the data and plot the moon's percent of shadow as viewed from Earth. In this way, anytime the moon takes a full moon, this corresponds to a zero, 
and the new moon corresponds to a 1. You can see the lunar cycle is a very well-defined periodic curve. Each peak corresponds to a new moon, and the period between new moon to new moon is 29 days, consistent with the explanation earlier. Our total solar eclipse date of April 8, 2024, does indeed fall on a new moon, but there's certainly many more new moons during this two-year time period. And if we bring in our perigee plot, you'll see how these curves are slightly out of sync. The new moons that don't align with perigee can be eliminated as possible total solar eclipses. However, you may notice that although April 8th does indeed line up with both curves, there are still quite a few new moons that occur during perigee, some even better than on April 8th. There's something else to the puzzle, and that brings us to our third and final piece of creating a total solar eclipse, the nodal alignment with the sun. Lunar node alignment is a very fancy sounding phrase, but in reality, it's very simple, just not often discussed. Let's go back to our sun, earth, and moon picture. Earth's orbit around the sun also takes an elliptical shape. This orbit can be thought of as a flat, two-dimensional plane, referred to in astronomy as the elliptic. The moon's orbit around Earth, on the other hand, does not lie in this plane, and is inclined around five degrees with respect to the elliptic. This lunar orbit tilt is what prevents most solar eclipses from occurring, as the moon's shadow overshoots the Earth. However, there are two points along the moon's orbit that intersect the elliptic. These two intersection points are referred to as nodes, represented as green spheres. You can draw an imaginary line between these two points, and this is often referred to as the nodal line. Now, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the orientation of the lunar orbit changes with respect to the Earth-Sun axis. From Earth's point of view, this appears as a clockwise rotation of the lunar orbit. There are two times during the year when the nodal line exactly aligns with the Earth-Sun axis. It's during these times when the Moon has an opportunity to eclipse the Sun and cast a shadow on Earth. In reality, there's around a 36-day window centered around exact nodal alignment for when any eclipses can occur. And these periods of time are referred to as eclipse seasons. And while there's an opportunity for eclipses every year, the Moon also has to be in perigee and in the new moon phase exactly at this time. For instance, here you can see the Moon partially eclipses the Sun just before nodal alignment, but then is that first quarter during the actual nodal alignment. For completeness, here is the configuration that needs to happen for the total solar eclipse to occur. Let's now plot this final piece of data for 2023 and 2024, and see how all of this fits together. The aspect of the lunar nodes we want to keep track of during the year is its angle between the Sun-Earth axis. When the nodal line is 90 degrees, or perpendicular to the Sun-Earth axis, no eclipses can occur. And when the nodal line is 0 degrees to the Sun-Earth axis, it's aligned to the Sun, and marks an eclipse season. To keep things consistent with our previous data, it'd be best to have values ranging from 0 and 1 instead of 0 and 90 degrees, with 1 calling out periods of potential solar eclipses. We know that cosine of 90 degrees is 0, and cosine of 0 degrees is 1. So to transform the angle, we can take the cosine of the angle between the Sun-Earth axis and nodal line. And to ensure only positive numbers, we can plot the cosine squared of this angle. In this way, a 1 corresponds to nodal alignment, and a 0 corresponds to when the nodes are perpendicular to the Earth-Sun axis. Let's see what this looks like. Notice, this is a much slower evolving process over time. And alignment only occurs two times per year. An alternative graphic that displays the same phenomena was released by NASA for 2024, with the yellow rotating axis showing the Sun-Earth axis, and the lunar nodes represented at the color transition of the light blue orbit. Again, only two peaks for 2024. The possible eclipse seasons can occur within 36-day windows of each of these peaks. Notice, April 8, 2024 occurs exactly at a time of nodal alignment. Now, I realize this was kind of built up piece by piece, and you might be saying, John, we already knew the answer before analyzing the data. Well, understandably, 
Taking in all the lunar data at once and finding an eclipse in all this is a bit overwhelming. But here's when normalizing data comes in handy. Since each data set has ranges between 0 and 1, with 1 representing the necessary condition for a total solar eclipse, you can think of each data set as carrying a certain probability or weight for a solar eclipse. And when multiplied together, you can truly see how the moon dances. This is pretty cool. So let's multiply each data set together and plot this data one last time. Pretty quiet at the beginning of 2023. Then, during the first eclipse season, we see a spike at around 67%. This spike corresponds to the hybrid solar eclipse that occurred on April 20th, 2023 in Western Australia and in Indonesia. And after this, smaller peaks outside the eclipse season. During the second eclipse season of 2023, there's one small peak, well below 50%. Let's come back to this in a minute. And for the first eclipse season of 2024, there's a massive spike, which exactly corresponds to the total solar eclipse on April 8th. For the final eclipse season, there are again some very minor peaks. A final note on the two eclipse seasons with minor peaks. Each of these time periods actually have annular eclipses. And you'll notice the peaks from the plot don't quite line up with the annular solar eclipse dates. The reason for this misalignment is due to how we prepped our data. Remember, we optimized for total solar eclipses. Annular eclipses occur when the moon is farthest away from the Earth. So if we wanted to optimize for annular eclipses, we would need to invert our perigee plot and then rerun the analysis. I just wanted to mention this for completeness. It's pretty fascinating how each of these three factors contributes to creating a total solar eclipse. When taken together, it's pretty clear how these events are predicted with such accuracy. And while this analysis was only performed on 2023 and 2024, the same approach can be performed for any year or time period. While eclipses occur every year on Earth, the total solar eclipse is truly a rare event to see in person, especially if you're not into traveling. After April of 2024, the next totality event in North America won't occur again for another 21 years. This is why you should make an effort to go see this eclipse. You may only get a few opportunities in your lifetime. I've put a resource link in the description for finding cities along the eclipse path on April 8th. I strongly suggest you go, even if you're not from the United States or Mexico. Videos and pictures will just never cut it. God, the moon has gotten in front of this. Okay, well, I, I, I don't know. It's interesting looking. The sun looks a little like the moon up there in my wall. I'm Dr. John, and thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to my channel, and let me know what you think below in the comments. And maybe I'll see you somewhere along the path of totality. Till next time.